Excellent. So welcome. It's uh, Wednesday, two o'clock for our study hall, Napa Valley Wine Academy. And we will be uh, today discussing, or Peter Marks will be discussing Riesling and the different organoleptic qualities of different styles of Riesling. So without uh, further ado, let me bring Peter up on screen here. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Christian. And hello, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well and this tasting might be a brief respite, respite from your shelter in, pace, in place, which I'm sure many of you are, and I sincerely hope you are all staying safe and healthy. As Christian said, today I'm doing a pair of Rieslings, and I chose Riesling because I believe it is the most transparent of all white grape varieties. Uh, in fact, you might even say it's the most transparent of all varieties, both red and, and white. And what I mean by that is, it's a grape that tends to show its sense of place very easily. So depending on you know, where the wine is grown and how it's made, there's a certain identified uh, style that you can associate with Riesling. Some people might argue that Pinot Noir is also a transparent grape variety. So I think those two varieties, Riesling and Pinot Noir, probably vie for the title of being the most transparent of all grape varieties. Um, and we all know that blind tasting is not easy. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to give you my tasting note and ask you to see if you can identify where it comes from. There will be four options at the end of my tasting note for you to choose from. And I must say that blind tasting, even with a grape like Riesling, is not an easy task. In fact, I teach many blind tasting techniques to master wine students. And one of the things that I like to say is that blind tasting is really a theory exam with a tasting. And what I mean by that is you must have a good foundation in your wine knowledge. You must know about winemaking techniques. You must know the characteristics of a grape. You should know the styles that are produced in different parts of the world. And when you know that, you can recognize wines a lot more easily. And Riesling, as we know, is a, is a grape that has certain characteristics. One of its true hallmarks is this wonderful, bracing, mouthwatering acidity, no matter where it's grown. Another thing, it can be made into a range of styles from dry to very sweet. You know, it makes the famous Trockenberry and Alsalesa wines you find in Germany, for example. And it also has, uh, because of the range of sweetness, it has a range of alcohol levels from very low to, you know, more moderate or, or medium plus. So let's see if you can help discern what these wines are today as I go ahead and start tasting my first wine. So again, cheers to all of you out there. So looking at this wine, I always hold it at about a 45 degree angle and uh, looks fairly pale in its intensity and has a nice uh, lemon color to it. Giving this wine just a little bit uh, closer to my nose and not even swirling it right here, I'm getting a fairly uh, noticeable aroma, but not really able to describe it in much detail. And I should mention, I'm actually sort of following the WSET systematic approach to tasting, which many of you may be WSET students. So I would call that a medium plus intensity. And I'm getting aromas of lots of floral characteristics, which are typical with Riesling. And for example, I'm getting honeysuckle, some white rose, maybe even some white blossom character, and then a lot of citrus. Uh, I'm getting lemon and lime, lime zest, a little bit of lemon peel, even some grapefruit. And then the fruit, uh, I get some tree fruit like uh, green apple, but very much of an underripe apple smell. Maybe even some green melon. And then beyond that, there's a sense of a, almost like a, a wet stone character. And maybe even just a, that typical petrol uh, that we often talk about with Riesling. It's a characteristic that can be uh, found in many Rieslings, and I'm getting a little bit of that here just developing in the wine. So given all that, you probably don't have a lot of sense of where this wine is from, but maybe you have an idea that it's from a, somewhat of a coolish climate, given those kind of citrusy characters and green apple smells. So let me give this a taste. Mm. Well, first of all, it's delicious. It's dry, and my mouth is watering right away, kind of like a fire hose. So I would call that high acidity. Um, body, it's kind of medium. You know, I associate body like we do with milk, 
So skim milk, which would be light body, uh, fully homogenized milk, which would be full bodied. And this is right in the middle. So I would characterize this as a medium bodied wine. The alcohol seems about medium too. And the flavors that I've noticed on the palate are similar to what I found on the nose. So again, a lot of floral characteristics, that lemon line, uh, citrus, green apple, some melon, and again, a little bit of the petroly character, maybe even a little hint of toast. I'm getting uh, just like a lightly toasted bread. That could be from a little bit of bottle age or a lot of times if the wine has been aged on the lees, which are the spent yeast cells, you can get a little bit of the uh, toasty character from lees. And I don't know for sure, but maybe that's what was done with this wine. Um, so Christian, if you want to put up a summary of my note there and just let everybody go through that again, you can see what I said. And overall conclusions for this wine, if I'm using the systematic approach under the WSET um, you know, system, I have what I call a very good quality wine. And we use the acronym BLIC for balance, length, inten intensity, and complexity. And with this wine, I get everything but the finish. So I didn't mention it, but I did get a medium plus finish. I found the wine is really good, has good balance, has fairly good intensity of medium plus intensity, and um, also has great complexity. I found a lot of those uh, fresh fruit aromas, but a little bit of that development uh, from the petroly character you get with some bottle age. I also think this wine can be consumed now, but certainly with that great acidity and still opportunity to develop more uh, bouquet or tertiary aromas and flavors, I think this wine could last quite a long time. I wouldn't hesitate to put this down for at least another five to possibly eight or even 10 years. All right, so here are the four options you have. Uh, let me mention those and see if you would like to use the chat box to see if you can discern what the regions are. So we have from Alsace, France is one possibility, Clear Valley of Australia, the Rheingau from Germany, and you probably know that German wines are often sweet, but they are making a number of drier wines these days, and Wachau uh, in Austria. So go ahead and use the chat function in the or the comments section on the Facebook page and let's see what your thoughts are about this. I'm kind of keeping an eye on that to see maybe my feed is not updating as quick. So I don't know if you are seeing anything, Christian, but if not you yet. can nope. let me know. Nope. Okay. People are thinking about that. Or if you have any questions, you may use the comment section as well. Okay. I think they're ready hey, for the reveal. Wine. Dry wine, high acid. Okay, so this is, you may put that up there. This is a Clare Valley Riesling. Alsace, okay, not a bad guess. Um, Alsace does make some drier style wines, and in particular, Riesling is one of the king of grapes from the Als Alsace region. The, the one thing I would think about if it was from Alsace, it probably would have a little bit more body. Those wines from Alsace, especially if they're dry, they tend to be maybe a little higher in alcohol. They might have a little bit more uh, viscous quality to it and probably a little bit more of a savory note. This one is really fresh on that lemon lime. And to me, that is one of the real markers for uh, Clare Valley or even Eden Valley uh, Rieslings from Australia. They have this wonderful lemon lime uh, character. Now the Clare Valley and you think of Australia, it, it is rather warm, but Clare Valley is a region that is ha has higher altitude. In fact, uh, the wine that we're drinking here, or I'm drinking, is planted in, vi in vineyards at an altitude of between 900 and 1800 feet elevation. And because of that, it's much cooler, uh, especially at night. So they get a big diurnal temperature uh, shift. And that allows the acidity and that bright uh, citrusy and green apple flavors to hold true. So pretty nice um, wine. Again, Rheingau recently, it could have been that. Maybe it would have been a little bit more stony, earthy. And Wachau, Austria uh, could be a possibility. But that wine would also probably have a little bit more uh, body and a little bit more of a, what I call tension. And Aust Austrian wines tend to have this real linear focus on the acidity. Okay, so there's our first wine. And I thought uh, any of you who had any of those guesses, again, this is not an easy thing to do. So our second wine today, let me open this glass here. 
Well, well, I should look at it first. And again, the color of this wine seems a little bit deeper. I'm looking at it. It's still lemon, but it has a medium intensity. And that could be a couple of possibilities. One, it could be a little bit older wine. Having a little deeper intensity could be from age. Maybe they used a little bit of skin contact, possibly, which would impart a little bit of color. Um, it could even be oak, but typically Riesling is not a grape variety that you see exposed to oak, or especially new oak. Um, and newer oak would give you some color uh, imparted into the wine. So my guess is might be a little bit older than the previous wine, or maybe some skin contact. Ooh. Uh, don't even have to get this really close to me to smell it. It is pronounced in the, in the intensity. And what I feel is really pronounced, even more floral character here than I found in the previous wine. Uh, again, the, the Clear Valley was more dominated by citrus fruits. This is really floral. I get honeysuckle, elderflower, uh, white rose, even fresh blossoms like in the spring. There's a little bit of... Uh, Apple-y, maybe a little bit riper apple, but no, still still green apple when I think about it. Even some pear, but more like a slightly unripe Bosque pear. And then there is some lemon, maybe a little tangerine. And then I'm getting a really strong sense of a, a wet stone, even more so than I found in the Clear Valley wine. This wine has almost like a flinty quality to it, like if you know, like a bic lighter. And then a little bit of age uh, or a bouquet from the bottle age. I think there's a honey note and a little bit of an almond, maybe some white mushroom. Um, and I'm, I'm even, dare say, I, get, I think I'm getting a little bit of a sulfury smell, which is coming through in the, in a smelling a little bit like a matchstick, like, a, like you just struck a match. And I have to say, I'm, I'm not sensitive to sulfur. You know, we have different thresholds for different uh, aromas and, I have to have it pretty high to notice it. So I think there's definitely some sulfur there. Now, what that tells me, just thinking um, logically with my theory knowledge, is that one of the reasons they use a high amount of sulfur is if it's a wine that has resi residual sugar, because you want to make sure that wine doesn't re-ferment in the bottle. And the sulfur sulfur will kill any yeast that might still be in the bottle if, if you didn't filter it out already. So let me go ahead and give an Given all those aromas, I'll go out and now taste and see what it tastes like. Mm. Does have some sweetness. Um, now on our scale from the WSET, you know, we go from dry to off dry to uh, medium dry, medium sweet, and sweet. And I'm kind of in between the medium dry and medium sweet, but I'm gonna call this a medium sweet wine, which leaves me, and the reason I say that, it leaves me with a little bit of sweetness even after the wine uh, finishes. What I would call medium dry is a wine that starts off fairly sweet, but then finishes more on the dry side. And I must say, um, it's not a clear-cut answer for me, but I would err on the side of medium sweet. And again, mouth-watering, just like the last wine. Um, got, the, got the fire hose going this time. It's, it's high in acid. And the, the body is, is medium. Now, some of that body is coming from the sugar, but I don't get a lot of body from the alcohol. So I'm going to call this low alcohol. And part of that is, is really just my theory knowledge, because if you have some residual sugar, you probably have to leave some of the um, sugars unfermented, meaning you're going to have a lower alcohol wine in the end. And yet the alcohol seems to bring this body down a little bit. Not that it's wa watery because you have the sugar there to boost it up a little bit, but it's certainly not as uh, as high in alcohol as the previous wine. And certainly there's no burning in the back of my throat, which I would get even with moderate alcohol levels. And then the pronounced flavors, very similar to what I found on the, on the nose, but I also get a little bit more earthy character. Um, so given all that, um, it's got great complexity. It's well balanced. It's got really good intensity. And finally, the finish, I'm still tasting it. It's really, really good. All right, Christian, if you want to put up a summary of those notes that I just ran through, as you can see, uh, medium sweet, high acid, low alcohol, medium body, pronounced flavors, a lot of floral, honeysuckle, elderflower, and blossomy green fruit like apple and some unripe boss pear, 
a little bit of citrus and certainly that whetstone petrol, some white mushroom and honey with a little bit of that bottle age from those providing those two uh, aroma characteristics and a really beautiful finish. This wine can last a long time. Now, options here, again, we have Alsace, France. We also have Columbia Valley in Washington, Marlboro, New Zealand, and the Mosul in Germany. So let's see, I see somebody put up New Zealand and that could be, that could definitely be a possibility. They make their Rieslings in Marlboro a little bit sweeter than what you find in Australia. So that's, that's a possibility. Um, I see somebody put up Mosul, Germany, and actually you are correct. Uh, this is rather low alcohol. This is only 8% alcohol in the label. Not that you would know that tasting it, but that minerality, that wet stony character, and also the high amount of SO2 is something that is commonly done in Germany. So having that theory knowledge, again, is something that can really help you in identifying some of the wines. Now, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to enjoy the rest of this beautiful, sunny afternoon here in Napa. It's it's in the mid-70s today, and you know, finally spring has sprung, but we are sheltered in place. So can't go out very much or do much at this time of year. So, Christians, do we have any questions from our viewers today? Uh, we do not uh, currently have any questions. Uh, so, if you okay. have any questions, please put them in the uh, in the comment section. Uh, we'll wait a couple of more uh, seconds here for any questions to roll in. Otherwise, <laughs> somebody wants some cookies. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and actually, that's a good. I'm glad somebody brought up food because I will. T I firmly believe that some of the best wine and food matches that I've had have enjoyed have been with sweeter Rieslings and not just German but many others in fact the first time I took a trade trip to Germany which was many years ago uh, one of the days we did a food and wine exercise and we had all of these German wines on a table probably had a dozen different wines and we had foods from everything from fresh salmon to chicken breast to hamburger patty to uh, apple tart and the sweeter wines actually went extremely well with just everything else on the table. And one of the things that can you can often interfere with a wine tasting great with food is having umami. Uh, umami can make a wine uh, taste a little bit stronger, meaning drier or more bitter. Uh, can also rob the fruit of some of its flavors. But if you have a sweet wine to begin with, any of the bitterness or tartness is gonna be masked by the sweetness that's already there. So a, a wine that has a little bit of sweetness is actually a great wine to dr drink with many foods, high in umami, like a, a chicken leg or the hamburger patty, which we had, and salmon. Uh, all those things were really high in umami. So they worked extremely well. We do we do have a question. So from Olga, what is what is the character of Northwest Riesling? Mm. So I'm assuming Finger Lakes Good. Riesling. Uh, or Northwest, maybe. Uh, Oregon, Northwest, yes. It, yeah, yes. Forgive yeah, so, my geography uh, faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, there are some great Rieslings coming from the Finger Lakes. But speaking of the Northwest, uh, I wish they had more Oregon Rieslings, to be honest. I know Bree Brosk uh, did a wonderful seminar yesterday on Oregon Pinot Noir, comparing it with uh, Burgundy. But I think the Rieslings that I have from Oregon have been really, really just spot on. They tend to be dry or maybe just a hint of sweetness, uh, but have some great, beautiful focus flavors. Um, I get a little bit more of the tree fruit, apple pear um, in the Oregon region. And certainly in, if you're talking about Washington, even there you get a little bit riper fruit because we're literally in a very hot desert of the Columbia Valley where most of the wines come from. And because of that, sometimes um, you can see some dry wines, but a lot of times the wines are made by just picking them a little bit early and maybe leaving some residual sugar to uh, keep those wines fresh and balanced. Uh, in fact, one of the largest, if not is the largest seller of Riesling in the United States is Chateau St. Michel. And they make a great, just their everyday Columbia Valley Riesling to me is a best buy. And then they make their higher end wine, which is the Arroyica, which is made in conjunction with Dr. Lozen from Germany. And that wine can have a little bit of sweetness, but it has such great bracing acidity that it doesn't taste uh, overtly sweet or cloyingly sweet. Yeah. So those that's just an example how you can get a variety of wines from the Northwest. Okay, we have another question from Diego. What would be the main hints uh, to differences between Germany and Australia, uh, Austrian Rieslings? 
Dry Germany style. and Austria. Um, yes. So generally, the body is going to be a little richer in Austria. Um, they they always, well, not always, but generally make their wines dry. They do have some late harvest ones. And I find, it to me, it's like um, Austrian wines tend to have a, an acidity that goes through just like an arrow. I mean, it's just really piercing acidity. The, even the focus of the fruits, it's a very linear type of wine. Where... German wines, they tend the acidity tends to be a little bit more rounder. Not that the, the acid is low, but you feel the acid all over your palate. Whereas in Austria, the, the acid just strikes you right in the middle um, and doesn't seem to go to one side or the other. That, that, I know that sounds a little bit strange. Um, Flavor-wise, I think you get um, similar flavors in the Austrian wines, but maybe Austria is less... Um, identifiable as Riesling. Sometimes they taste a little bit like Gruner. In fact, I've mistaken Australian or uh, Austrian Gruner Veltlinger and Riesling quite a, quite a few times. There is a similarity with some of the Austrian Rieslings that have that slight vegetal note, which is characteristic of the Gruner grape as well. So right. I think German wines maybe show a little bit more purity of the variety. So the citrus, the floral character, and maybe some of the tree fruits. Okay, we have a, a food and wine pairing question for you, Peter. Uh, mm-hmm. Does the seasoning used on foods, meats, impact the flavor, notes of wine? Yeah, in fact, I'll do a little plug if I can. Uh, we, I just finished a, a micro course, as we're calling it, on enjoy any wine with any food. And that whole course is all about balancing the components of the wine with the components of the food. And we do spend a fair amount of time discussing umami taste. Because a lot of times you can have a great wine and a great dish of food. They taste beautiful by themselves. But when you put it together, the wine is thrown out of balance because the umami, as I said, can make the wine taste stronger. And when you're putting wine and food together, those components must work. And we tell you in this little micro course how to do that. It's very simple. You can balance umami taste with acid and salt taste. So I won't give you any more details about that, but uh, I hope you take that course. Now, that said, once you get the components working, then you can inter- interact with the flavors. I will say, though, that components, we can predict very carefully what's going to happen to the to the individual who's tasting that uh, food and wine. But c- flavors are so subjective. You know, you can't predict if someone's going to like an asparagus and a butter sauce because, and maybe that's a great wine to go with Sauvignon Blanc because they both have those grassy flavors. But what if you don't like grassy sylvian blogs or you don't like asparagus so i let people experiment on their own but i do feel that spicy foods for me tend to work pretty good with more aromatic varieties because you do want to always taste the wine and if you're drinking uh, a wine that's got good aroma intensity like a riesling it will still be able you'll still have those fruit flavors even if you eat something that's spicy and very flavorful Uh, so do match if you will the intensity of the food and the intensity of the wine great uh, and then we have a question here from Olga again. It says, Peter, do you teach any courses online? Uh, you, in fact, teach a couple of courses online for uh, for us and are developing yes. uh, another one. You want, Maybe you want to talk about that. Uh, we are. So uh, as I mentioned, the food and wine course we just did, um, I do some of our WCT classes, uh, although we have many other great instructors that do those online courses as well. But I'm also now working on a new course, which is um, easily confused wines. And again, this will be kind of looking at wines that when you're blind tasting, how they can easily be confused. And I'll just give you an example. When I was studying for the master wine exam, I was having a heck of a time trying to differentiate between Chenin Blanc, Riesling, and Sauvignon Blanc. And the fact is, those three grapes all have great acidity. They're, They're naturally high in acidity. And they do have some similar flavors as well. So I was continually mixing those up, and I finally figured out a way that I can differentiate them. And there are red varieties that you know can be the same confusing uh, nature about them. So we'll do a course that will talk about how you can differentiate easily confused wines. Great. And then he's also author of the Napa Valley Wine Expert um, right. course and yeah. uh, the American Wine Expert course. So a couple of different uh, different ones as well. 
Great. Any, if there's uh, not any other questions, we'll go ahead and thank Peter for uh, joining us today. Uh, thanks so much, Peter. And I look forward to having you back uh, again next, next week. In the meantime, we will have an interview with Peter and Mary Margaret uh, McCammack, who is an expert on all things uh, Corton, the Hill of Corton in, in Burgundy. Uh, so make sure and join us for that. Uh, and that She's will- the smartest master of wine that I know. Living, I will just say in the Bay Area, okay? And I'm sorry I've offended some people, but she's a whippersnapper. <laughs> and we'll, we're excited to have her here. And that'll be Saturday at 1 o'clock with, uh, with Peter Marks. Again, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you back here on Facebook Live uh, very soon. Cheers.